Um, okay, so welcome to yet another uh, EPC Apply Core. Last year, we held our first Apply Core session in the Anglophone sector, and the workshops were a really big hit. Uh, this year, we're offering even more APCs than last year. Uh, today's APC is specifically for SI and SVI contexts, but we think the strategies um, offered apply in alternative settings as well. Um, managing challenging behaviors can be well challenging. And so we thought it would be beneficial to consult with an expert on these matters. Our special guest speaker today is Janice Bichet Jarvis. Janice has worked as a social professional integration agent and an educator for close to 20 years. And for the past 12 years, she has served as the manager for uh, the CES de l'Ouest de Lille de Montréal and the Directorate of Intellectual Disabilities, Autism Spectrum Disorders, and Physical Disabilities. Uh, she has a bachelor's in human relations from Concordia and a master's in development of organizations from the University of Laval. She's also taught um, uh, in the uh, SCC department at LaSalle College. So you may have special ed techs uh, in your classrooms who uh, took a course with Janice or were trained by that department. Um, she, I've, I, I, had the opportunity to work with Janice on numerous projects over the years. And she's been such uh, an amazing partner uh, for Endeavor here on the West Island, but she's also been um, vital to establishing and maintaining partnerships across the island of Montreal, including at the EMSB. Uh, I've gotten to know Janice quite well, and I can say she's kind, empathetic, um, but also highly experienced and is a true leader in her field. Last year, I had the pleasure of working with her to develop a website which maps the various programs and supports available to persons with intellectual disabilities and autism who live on the west, uh, in West Montreal and West Monterey-Régie. Um, I'm going to share the URL to that website in our chat momentarily. Um, we developed the site with our colleagues, Milan Cardin from the LBPSB and Ariane Billy from Action Main and I share this link not simply as a shameless plug for our most recent project, um, but also to highlight Janice's collaborative spirit, especially when it comes to creating resources and programming for our community. So without further ado, please welcome Janice Jarvis to our APC. So you can feel free to unmute and applaud if you want, or you can wave your hands or whatever you like, okay. drop comments in the chat. But welcome, Janice. So grateful to have you here today with us. Wow, thank you. I hope uh, the presentation lives up to the buildup. That was pretty incredible. <laughs> um, so Matthew had asked if I could uh, talk a little bit about challenging behaviors and managing anxiety. Um, we give this kind of training to our staff over the course of years, and it's usually three or four days worth of training that I've tried to come to condense into um, a 30 slide PowerPoint so that it hopefully will also give you guys time for questions or problem solving at the end. Um, if that doesn't work out, uh, we can look at, maybe I can share my email address and we can communicate that way. If you have any questions at the end that I wasn't able to get to. So when it comes to uh, behavioral challenges, it's not just a question of supporting somebody in a crisis. It's being able to understand where does the crisis come from? So how do we analyze the situation? How do we predict that the crisis is going to happen in order to prevent it from happening again? And over time, being able to give the person coping strategies so that it'll diminish the degree of crisis. So on the agenda today, definition of in French, we call it trouble de comportement and trouble grave de comportement. We're going to talk about analyzing behaviors in terms of the ABC. Some of you may have seen this already. We're going to talk about a tool that we use in our services called the multimodal tool or the biopsychosocial approach. We're going to talk about the escalation grid. So how do you recognize the signs of escalation in people? And how do you know what intervention to use at which point? We're going to talk about how we approach our clients, which is always using a strength-based positive approach. We're going to talk about 
anxiety and coping strategies. And I put some resources in the PowerPoint. So I'll share that with you. And you can take it home with you and, and look up some of those websites yourselves. And hopefully there will be time for questions. So you'll see there's references. I referenced whatever I could. And I put in as many resources as I could because I know the time is going to fly. All right. So, trouble de comportement in English, it's an action or a set of actions that's judged to be problematic because they deviate from social, cultural, or developmental, developmental norms, which can end up being prejudicial to the client and their social or physical environment. So, that could be uh, behaviors like. Um, running into the street to avoid a dog on the sidewalk. That could be um, putting their hands in their pants and masturbating in public. Um, that could be um, pushing ahead of other people while they wait in line uh, to get on a bus. Okay. And then we differentiate trouble grave de comportement because the challenging behavior is severe enough that it puts in danger uh, in actuality or potentially the physical integrity of the person themselves so they could self-injure. They could put other people at risk or they could be destructive in their environment. And these behaviors prevent them from having the same freedoms or from integrating or from developing social relationships. So um, this definition, well, I've, said where it comes from. And the uh, Processus Clinique Morialé is something that all readaptation centers use. And it was uh, developed by Natalie Garson and uh, Mark Sabara, um, uh, Guy Sabara, sorry, and Mark Bassé. And it's, it's the Bible where all of our works started from. The ABCs. So where we start with when it comes to behavior is we always look at what is the function of the behavior. So when somebody says, I don't know what happened out of the blue, he just reacted and he just started stomping around. Well, you have to look at what did that function, what did the behavior serve in terms of a function for that person? So ask yourself, what's the diagnosis of the person? So do they have ADHD and you're asking them to sit in their chair for 90 minutes without getting up? Well, causing a disruption gives them that opportunity to get up. What are their vulnerabilities? Are they sensitive to noise and sound and, and light in the room? Are you putting them in a situation where they're having to have all these sensory inputs in their environment and they have no opportunity to escape it? So what are the antecedents? What happened right before? The noise, the crowding, the demands, that's the A. What was the behavior? So describe it objectively, not, oh, he was you know, a real pain in the butt. It has to be more descriptive in terms of you know, what exactly did he do? Was he banging his head? Well, maybe he has a headache and he can't communicate. So we'll look at all of that in a minute. And then what was the consequence? So when he did the behavior, what happened next? Did you say, leave my class? Oh, okay. Well, if he didn't like sitting next to the noisy person, now he's left the class. That's the consequence for him is, wow, every time I want to leave your class, all I have to do is be disruptive and you're going to let me escape to the hallway. Or, okay, be quiet. We're in a bank. I need you to be quiet. Here's a cookie. Well, now he knows being quiet will be rewarded with a cookie. So you have to really look at what happened next. So when we meet somebody for the first time um, and we know that they've been having challenging behaviors, we start to put it, we plot it out on um, on a very complicated looking chart that I can share with you if we have time. And we use what we call the multimodal. So uh, other, I think the WHO calls it the biopsychosocial approach, but we call it the multimodal and it's um, 
a collaboration between uh, Dorothy Griffiths and um, I don't know, I think it's William Gardner. They developed this tool at Brock University and um, we've hijacked it in Quebec um, and it's being used in a lot of other um, countries at this point. And actually they're starting to look at whether this is a tool that can be used for the elderly who are starting to have signs of dementia and that are in care because they, they realize that this is a tool that's actually multifaceted and doesn't only have to apply to people with an intellectual disability or autism. So it's a tool that's used to objectively determine the vulnerabilities, the instigating conditions and the reinforcing conditions of a person, both internally and environmentally or externally. So I'll go on to describe a little bit about what that external context could include. So the physical environment, I touched on it a bit before. So in terms of objects, are things uh, making noise? Are they moving? Is there a lot of personal space? Are there sensory elements in the environment that could be impacting the person? The social environment, um, is it too complex for the person's adaptive functioning? Do they have good relationships with family and peers so they would therefore be able to, um, uh, I'm forgetting the word, they'd be able to, to then um, translate that in their, in their school environment, for example, where they'll know how to behave appropriately or were they raised in an institution where, or in a group home where they might not understand the differences between close friends and family members and, and have that kind of a boundary setting? Uh, were they raised in a culture that's different than ours? Do they have significant other people? Do they have permission to have significant other people in their lives? Um, if they have autism, are you seating them in such a way where they're face to face with somebody else? And so they're being expected to maintain eye contact and that's too challenging a stimulus for them. And then in terms of the program and the routine, how predictable is it? Are there a lot of unexpected changes? Uh, can they navigate those changes or does that destabilize them completely? Um, the internal context, those fields would include what are the personal characteristics of the individual, what are their skills in terms of their, well, their fears, their phobias, anxiety, memory, and attention. Um, do they have deficit skills in terms of functioning, in terms of their, their learning style, their communication, their ability to maintain self-control, their their stress management, how do they adapt to all the changes in their environment or are they gonna to need to be taught a lot of those things? And what are their diagnoses in terms of their physical health? Do they have any health issues that could be preventing them from being their best self? Um, do, they, are they, do they have chronic ear infections or do they wear hearing aids and the batteries may be dead? so they can't hear that well. Uh, could they have a, a, a dental issue? We have a lot of clients that end up with constipation and you would be shocked you know, how many of them will have behaviors as a result of just feeling off and they don't know why. Um, how is the quality of their sleep? Do they suffer from frequent UTIs? Do they understand their menses? And do they have any kind of pain management leading up to it and during it? And then there's also the mental health diagnosis. So do they actually have a diagnosis of any mental health issue? Do they have any neurological issues? So epilepsy or autism or any other a brain lesion that could be impacting on their cognitive abilities? Do they take medications that could be giving them side effects or do they have genetic syndromes that could also limit their capacity in certain domains? So 
The reason we ask you to look at all of those areas are, for example, and this is something I talk to parents about often when we see that a client has anxiety disorder that's really out of check. If somebody had diabetes and the doctor suggested that you give them medication for diabetes, um, you wouldn't withhold it. And on the, by the, other, on the other hand, if somebody is diabetic, you wouldn't put them in a situation where you're providing them with sugar-laden foods. So if somebody is autistic or is on the spectrum, would you put them in an environment that's going to impact their senses in a way that their senses can't handle it? So you have to start thinking in that way. They're communicating something because something is going on. And if we looked at their, um, I'll go to the previous page, their deficit skill sets, and we see that communication is an issue. And for most of our guys with intellectual disability and autism, communication is an issue. We're expecting them to communicate pain when they might not even be able to recognize it. We're expecting them to communicate some kind of distress in their environment when all they hear is sensory overload. So the next step is we start looking at the signs of escalation. So we use a tool that's called the de-escalation grid. And it was um, part of our best practice for its, well, since later than 2014 where we developed this multimodal tool in conjunction with a de-escalation grid. So this is a tool that's used to actively prevent the escalation of problem behaviors by identifying the precursors of a crisis, so your A, your antecedent, and taking preventative steps at the onset of the warning signs. These adaptations could include adaptations to the environment. So we'll, we would be looking at, you know, do you have ambient lighting or fluorescent lighting? For somebody with autism or epilepsy, the difference could be huge. Um, would you have tennis balls on the bottom of the chair? So when the chairs move, it doesn't scrape on the floor, which again could be an irritant for some people. The two techniques that are used to uh, achieve adaptation would be the removal or the reduction of the risk factors, so noise, crowd, or demands, but also introducing stimuli or adaptations that encourage a competing behavior that's more functional. So in other words, if somebody is sitting in the classroom and they're, they're getting uh, bombarded with stimuli and the way they handle it is negatively to be able to avoid and to be kicked out of the room. Instead, you're going to teach them how to say, I can't handle it, I need a break, so that this is a more adaptive way to get what they want, but in a way that in a movie theater would still not, would not garner unwanted attention in a restaurant would be an adaptive way of saying, I need a break as opposed to having a big crisis in the middle of a crowded area. So in our de-escalation grid, we always um, break down the levels of the observable behavior that we see, and we match it with the intervention that so far has proven to be successful. Now, I should uh, let you know that when we have a client that has severe challenging behaviors, we are supposed to have monitoring meetings monthly at, at minimum to tweak the de-escalation grid, to tweak all the diagnoses, to tweak all the data we're collecting to see what's working and what isn't. So it's a very intensive approach to behavior management. I would say that most of our clients um, are displaying signs of anxiety so anxiety is definitely something that I'm familiar with. What other way? So the observations are gathered based on the physical signs presented by the client. So do you see a change in their 
uh, rate of speech, the tone, the volume, are they repeating it? Are they tapping their finger? Do they need to pace? Are they, are they tapping their foot? And how well do they comply with demands when they're at the various levels of escalation? So you would, you would include interventions that are preventative, that are rehabilitative. Um, you, would, you would use um, teaching of coping and replacement strategies. And you would try to do things that are gonna elevate or enhance their lifestyle and their pleasurable activities. So instead of using a punishment-based system, we do try to use a reward-based system. And we also try to, to teach that by being able to have self-control and manage their anxiety, they will be able to have more positive opportunities, especially because if you think of, I mean, I can't think of too many of my clients that would be in an EMSB or Lester B. Pearson school at this time. They would probably require a specialized school and they would probably require a segregated school or a segregated work program because their behaviors prevent them from going to camp or from going into classrooms. So this is all with the intent of trying to ensure that we can have these clients learn those coping strategies so that they will be accepted into society to a greater degree. All right. So level zero is where we always start a de-escalation grid. That's when the person is functioning at their best. And you have to be able to describe that individual at their best. So my best may be that somebody could think I'm practically comatose and somebody who revs at a higher frequency may not be able to sit in their chair for that long. They talk quickly, they need a lot of stimulation around them. So each of us as an individual has a very different neutral. So what does it look like for them? What are they doing? And that is the time that you're going to teach them their coping strategies, because when they are at their best, they're the most receptive to learning anything. At that moment, that's when you're going to use a social story. You're going to show them their visual schedule. You're going to teach the, replacing strat the replacement strategies. So you may sit and do a five-minute chair yoga where you're doing a breathing exercise. You may go through what can you do if ever you have a struggle. You're going to do it then when they're calm so that you can cue them to it when they're not so calm. At level one, what does that person's sign of agitation begin to look like? So do they start by um, licking their lips more? Do their, the, do their eyes start to look a little bit more uh, bug-eyed or um, does their mouth get tight? Do they pace? Do they have persever perseverative speech? Uh, do they tap their finger? So it's a small sign of agitation or anxiety or irritability. And at that point, a good strategy would be to say, hey, I see that you look like something's going on. What is it? How can I help? So you can listen, support, use empathy, help them resolve the issue. Sometimes it's just listening to them and say, wow, that sounds tough. Wow, that sounds like it was a really rushed morning. Getting out the door sounds like it was really difficult. Let's take a few breaths and then we'll be able to go on with our day. So you can use open questions and you can reduce the stimuli in the environment, let them vent, and then you can move on. But with level two, you're starting to see a greater intensity. We call this um, in, in our lingo, the fitness, the frequency, the intensity, and the, uh, the, the degree of uh, time that it, that it uh, keeps on going for. So what, what intensity are you seeing? How frequent is it? Um, is there tone going up, the volume going up? So you'll see that it's, it's incremental 
it may flash and go there rather quickly, but you will see that, that it can be that ignoring that first level of escalation will have it go much quicker to the second. So at this point, they could be unresponsive to whatever you tried to do with them in the previous level. So if you were giving them empathy and saying, hey, what's wrong? They may start to get a little bit more belligerent, a little bit more demanding, a little bit louder. In, in our process, usually at that point, if they do have a medication to help them calm, we would usually wait um, about 15 minutes in that state of level two, try to redirect them twice. And if it doesn't work, we would usually administer a PRN. We would give a medication at that point that was previously described by their, their doctor. So the type of support we would give would be, we would help them with regulation. So direct them to the coping strategy that we use. So I think it's time now for us to start your breathing. Let's do it together, okay? Um, you would do one thing at a time. You wouldn't bombard them with too much overtalk because they can't hear it. There's too much else going on internally and you don't want to add to that. You wait for them to integrate what you're asking them always calmly and you offer them a PRN if, well, I doubt that will be your situation, but in ours, that's what we would often do. In level three, and you'll probably not see that in your environments, but we, we see level three and sometimes level four, um, there's the, the intensity and the severity of the behaviors will increase. Um, it can become a risk management situation where there could be physical altercations, um, destructive behavior, things can be thrown, punches and chairs and all the rest of it. Um, so we use our protective techniques. We all have training in uh, CPI. And if ever there's a way to lock the person in a room that we can supervise them as long as they don't have self-injurious behavior, if that's the path of least danger, then that's what we do until we can make sure the PRN works. Uh, never show anger or fear because if you show that you're afraid, you are not able to help them manage their behavior. They can't trust you to help them when they're anxious if you're afraid. So even if you are afraid, learn to wear a mask that doesn't show it because our clients can tell. Definitely don't show anger because you're just meeting fire with fire and now you're helping them to escalate their behavior. So level four would be a violent outburst, but again, you guys won't, won't see any of that. So that's what we deal with. But the most important part in all of this process is the recovery. Because you can imagine if any of us did something where we lost so much control of ourselves in an environment where we actually wanna feel respected and cared for, and we wanna have reciprocal and uh, important relationships, it's really important to reassure the person after that they're okay, you're okay, and the relationship is okay. Because if recovery doesn't happen, it helps to reinforce that whole cycle of anxiety and, um, and humiliation for the person. So we have to see it as a blip, not a def definition of who the person is. So that this way, your therapeutic rapport and your ability for them to trust you to work with them is, is secure and maintained. Um, many times I've been on call for our organization and we have an on-call manager every week. Um, for We have 250 intermediary resources and somebody has to be available in case there's a crisis. And I, I can hear the caregiver intervening with the client or the staff who works in the home. And I can hear them say, well, I'm gonna tell her what you did. And boy, are you gonna be in trouble now? And I'll spend time on the phone, calming the client down. 
And then I'll, I'll say, okay, pass me back to the caregiver. And the caregiver will say, yeah, you're okay now, but did you tell her when you did blah, blah, blah? And so right away, it escalates the behavior again. So really important that you reestablish your therapeutic rapport with the person and they know that you're there for them. And it's okay that they had that momentary lapse. Janet, is, is it okay if I ask a question? Sure, go ahead, Jennifer. So nice when you have you to again. give, you two, <laughs> we just saw each other a couple hours ago. Um, when you have to give this feedback to your, your staff, because I'm sure they sometimes get defensive when you give the feedback that they might be escalating or um, feeding into this uh, scenario. Um, is there a way <laughs> that you approach it? Is sure. it you give it yeah. So um, we, we sit, so you're familiar with Benny because that's, um, that's a program where you have some teachers and uh, the team will sit and we'll, we'll do a post-mortem on, on an episode and we'll go through what did everybody do? What could we have done differently? What did we observe? What, did the, what was the client doing? How did we handle it? One of my staff that, that's a, a pretty burly guy that likes to be the go-to person when there's crises that happen, he, he actually escalated the crisis because he tried to physically touch the person who was out of control. And there was absolutely no reason to do that. And it did escalate him. And he, he, so we had to have that conversation. And I said, listen, if nobody is being hurt, if he's throwing furniture, well, get out of the way, lock the door and let him throw furniture to his heart content. You don't have to prevent him from breaking stuff. You have to prevent him from hurting himself or other people. And by trying to hold on to him, that could have hurt you, especially if you're alone, because our interventions are always supposed to be two people and there's a certain technique. So when we went through it, because we went through all of those stages and, you know, was, were people panicking and who could have gone where and who could have taken care of the other clients and who felt more comfortable doing X, Y, Z. So for next time, and it's a choreography that you're planning, right? And so it's to get the team together to be able to all be part of how are we going to choreograph so that everybody's safety comes first. Um, the other thing is that, that to work in those environments, all our, our staff have a refresher while they are trained in crisis prevention and intervention. It's a two-day training. And uh, day two is, um, is, is the, going, well, day one is all of the escalation signs and day two is all of the physical holds that we have to learn and when it's appropriate and when it isn't. Um, and we also have rules on, on touching our clients. We're not allowed to restrain them without being trained, number one, because if you're not trained and you hurt them, you can be sued. Um, and, and number two, um, without permission. So if we have the consent of the client, their family, a psychologist recommendation to use a physical hold, we, we can use it on, with regularity. We have a lot of hoops to jump through to do that. Um, but, but the staff take it very seriously because when you use the word, you know, if you intervene improperly, you can be sued. Um, it, it holds a lot of weight. And also it's not, people are gonna be human in a situation and they are gonna use their default for a crisis. So it's giving the staff other tools as well so that when they're in a crisis, they feel equipped to handle it. So we really try to look at it as a team, even though there's only two staff that work with eight clients in a group, it's a team of 11 plus three teachers. Did, did that answer the question? Yeah. Yes, absolutely, thank you. So the way that we, we um, approach it, and I think at EMSB, Carolina and Larry gave uh, a training in, in one of your PID days on the positive approach. Um, usually we give that training to all staff as well. And 
This is based on a really old theory of social role valorization of Wolfensperger and on the uh, concept of quality of life. And uh, again, the Ministry has, of, of Health and Social Services um, has given us um, a gamme de service where they want us to favorize social participation and integration for our clients as part of our mandate. Okay, so I did uh, provide some of the links to well the ministry document, not to Wolfensberger or or uh, or the quality of life indicators. Um, but you guys know, I guess, about those theories and ish. Okay, if it, it should come clear. If not, I can I can probably one sentence them later. So this approach is centered on the person. We look for their strengths. We identify their interests, their desires, and their skills to uh, support them to realize their life plan so that it helps them. Oh, I see some stuff in the chat. Okay. Um, so that this way we're, we're working with them to help them achieve what they want in their life. We always look at trying to create a rewarding relationship between our clients and others. And we always speak to them in a way, or we try, I hope, in a way that's respectful, that's stimulating and, and rewarding. So uh, the message I often give to my team is, you know, if you wouldn't say that or do that to one of your peers, then it's not appropriate to be doing with one of your clients. So even if it's in a helping way, um, in one of my programs, I have a client who, who has a lot of um, saliva and he drools. And I'm not saying don't go and help wipe that. But when you go over to him, you ask his permission to do that and say, hey, I notice that you're drooling a bit. Do you want me to help you here? I've got a clock. Or, oh, I notice your pants are starting to come down. Can I give you a hand with that? And you wait for the implied consent. And the reason I stress this a lot is that um, David Hingsberger, who I don't know if any of you had the opportunity to ever hear him speak. He, he passed away, unfortunately, this summer. I did link to some of his work in this presentation, but I met him probably 25 years ago. And he talked a lot about how easily our clients can be victims of sexual abuse. And by not teaching them in our role as helpers, by not teaching them that they have agency over themselves, and by not asking for their consent, even if it's something that a helper is supposed to do, uh, we're teaching them that other people can touch their bodies without their consent. So I know it's not a big part of this training, but if you walk away with anything, just remember how easily victimized our clients can be, um, unfortunately, by taxi drivers or uh, staff somewhere or anybody anywhere. And we need to teach them um, that they have the right to be respected the way I would never expect somebody to come up to me and wet my face. So same for them. So this little link, um, I can play it, but I think um, in the interest of time, we won't. You can link on it, um, but he talks about that. And, and David, David Hingsberger has one hour talks that I, he's just, he was such a fascinating, fascinating man. Anyway. The positive approach continued. So what we do is we try to develop, we try to adapt and, um, and to have a, a rehabilitation and social mission in order to improve the quality of life. And that's the goal of everything that we do for, for our clients. We want to make sure that we support families and friends and we wanna help them have supportive and empathetic relationships with their family and friends. And so developing their skills, their social skills in particular, 
um, in, a, in a positive way is really important because if we're punitive, they're gonna think that's the way to behave with others as well. And this approach seeks to understand the challenging behavior and it's preventative. So again, the therapeutic rapport piece, super important. Um, Rice, who I also got to see speak years ago, um, also said something really important that it's very, it's easier to prevent the problematic behavior than to deal with it after it appeared. So really important to think about what we do to contribute. If we're snippy and snappy because somebody's loud, if they were trying to get away from a stimulus that was bothering them, we're just escalating it. So we need to make sure that we don't lose sight of the needs and the rights of our clients. They are individuals with rights and we need to teach them to, um, to be able to speak for themselves and their rights. Um, our clients who were born in, in the 1970s and earlier might have been institutionalized and didn't, didn't get brought up in families, may never have uh, been able to choose what color they wanted to paint their room, what clothing they wore for the day. Their closets could have been left locked because other people might get into their stuff. Um, they never got to choose their meals or their outings or go to people's houses and hang out. Um, they were um, potentially victims of other people's sexual exploration or their own um, sharing rooms. It, it, wasn't, it wasn't pretty institutionalization. So if you look at some of the behaviors that some of the clients that you may be working with now, you need to know a little bit more about where do they come from? What did, what did they live and why do they express themselves in the way they do now? So those vulnerabilities, were they always afraid of their things being stolen? And so now they hoard it in their pockets and in their socks and in their bras and under their shirt because they didn't know when they got home if their preferred stuff would still be there or if they left their room, if they would come back to finding their things still there. Um, also, it's, it, we use the positive approach in order to uh, make sure that we continue to have collaboration with uh, community resources. So in our case, it would be with school boards as well as community organizations. And to make sure that we're modeling treating clients as individuals with dignity and choices and respect the same as anybody else. We want to help our clients to um, learn and grow and develop and to let them know that they are important and that they are equal. So um, making sure in the adult settings that um, they have a choice, it could be a, a poor choice with poor consequences, but it is still their choice to make. Um, so that's really important. And when we're giving people, when we're teaching people about making choices, we want to make sure that we're enforced, reinforcing things in the right way. So when you reinforce something, um, it increases the likelihood that the behavior will be repeated. It can be a positive or a negative way of reinforcing it. And the positive reinforcement is when something is added to increase the occurrence of a behavior. So in other words, um, wow, you cleaned your desk really well. Um, maybe I wouldn't give a food reward, but I'd say good job. Um, for somebody who wants to earn something, maybe in your classroom, one person gets to, I don't know, I just watched the Queen's Gambit again, so gets to clean the the erasers for the chalkboard, if you still even use those. <laughs> um, and if they clean their desk five days in a row, it'll be their turn or whoever gets the most or however you do the added um, reward. And the negative is when something is taken away. So if you don't stop doing that, I'm gonna do whatever. And the client starts to self-injure, for example. So um, again, it's the whole concept of having them leave the classroom. 
if they're if they're being disruptive, well, if they were get trying to escape from something, then you're reinforcing that behavior. Punishment is something that is decreases the likelihood of the behavior when it's added into an environment. Um, so that would be scolding, removal of privileges. However, <laughs> there's a lot of caveats about punishment because punishment will um, create a lot of anxiety. So we try to never use punishment as opposed to differentiating it from a natural consequence for having a behavior. So if I'm going to have a crisis and hit the taxi driver, well, there will be a natural consequence because adaptive transportation is gonna say, we don't accept that behavior. And then you'll have a natural consequence where you may not be able to get to go to some of your preferred activities because you can't get there anymore. That's very different than threatening and taking away something as a, as a person who has power over an adult. So with a natural consequence, that's the event that occurs naturally following the behavior. So um, it's not necessarily used with the intent of modifying the behavior. However, it teaches the client to learn about the boundaries and understand that the choices they are making does have an impact. So if somebody starts to get aggressive in um, a day program or is caught stealing in a store, the police will be called. That's a natural consequence for everybody in the world. If I eat my whole lunch at 10 o'clock in the morning, well, 12 o'clock is gonna come and I'm gonna be hungry. Uh, you could end up expelled from school if you have hopefully more than one, but not necessarily any aggressions, but let's hope we'll never see something like that. So I'll just briefly go over the pitfalls of punishment. So the reason we try not to use punishment as a tool is because it takes away the right of their choices as well as their participation in their own interventions giving them attention for an undesirable behavior is still attention. It can create a lot of anxiety about their behavior because that whole notion of, oh my God, I'm gonna get into trouble or the sense of rejection from others, it may cause damage to their self-esteem, to their relationships. I had a client who would, um, leave the day program and she had a swimming activity at six o'clock at night she would get home at three three thirty um so she would sit on a rocking chair in her living room and she would just rock back and forth back and forth and she would be ruminating about i've got to be good i've got to be good i've got to be good because her swimming was coming at 6 30 and she had to be good to go to swimming the pressure on that girl, she made grooves in the floor and invariably by six o'clock it exploded because the anxiety of needing to be good was so high that she never or rarely made it to swimming. So we have to be really careful how we phrase things to our guys because they, they will become more anxious instead of this helping them. Um, so it creates a lot of, as well, I already said that one, and um, we can also have our own biases about what is and isn't appropriate in terms of behavior. So we have to really be careful about that. Um, and teaching of compliance sets up vulnerability for our clients for victimization and abuse. It, it really, really does. I can't say that often enough. It's the statistics when I met David Hingsberger. Um, a good 25 years ago, I think the statistics on institutionalized women that were victims of sexual assault um, was close to 100%. And for the men living in institutions, it was over 70%. So staggering, just staggering. So instead of using punishment, we try to emphasize positive replacement skills. 
So all behaviors exist because they serve a purpose. As I said before, what's the function of the behavior? So we may not understand it, but what is the function? And if we're gonna remove a behavior, so if somebody has to rock in order to feel good, um, and that rocking has become really disruptive in a classroom, we need to know the function of the behavior and to replace it with an alternative behavior that meets the same purpose, and that's a positive replacement. So in other words, if somebody has um, some kind of tooth pain or, or head pain and they're hitting, telling them to stop hitting or you're not going to get to watch TV, it's not functional. You're, you're not teaching them to be able to express what it is that's going on. So teaching them to use a picto, show that they have pain, giving them a Tylenol, that is going to reduce the, the likelihood of the aggression happening again. There's a really good um, video. It's, it's short, but we're not going to watch it because we're going to run out of time. Um, anxiety and coping strategies. So what you would want to do in the next sequence is, okay, what is the diagnosis of the person? So if they're showing signs of anxiety and there's somebody who has, um, who has autism, um, what are their deficit skills? Is it a communication issue? Is it a sensory issue? Always start from there. Look at what clues you can have from their diagnosis. Are they somebody who's prone to seizures? Um, I have a client who used to be at Benny, is now at Carche, but he right before the day before he's going to have a seizure, he, he grabs, he tries to grab at people because he's not feeling well. He knows it's coming. And so he'll try to grab at people, grab at people, but not because he wants to hurt them. It's because something's wrong, something's wrong, help me. And he doesn't do it to cause pain. He's doing it because he's in distress. So we had to look at, okay, what's the function of the behavior? Why is he doing it? What can we replace that with? Okay, we can give him something to squeeze. We can reassure him. We can have him lie down on a sofa if he's not feeling well. There's a lot of different things we can do once we figure out why is the behavior happening? So is it sensory? Is it environmental? Is the person gonna gain or lose something as a result? Is it a communication deficit? Is there a change in routine? Where's my favorite person? My teacher that's always here isn't here today. You know, or the taxi driver wasn't the one, or I had to wait to get into the building. And usually I get to go in right away. Hey, wait a second. That guy is always after me. Now he's before me. He got to pick the first ball in gym and he's supposed to be last. Was there a change in the routine? Something simple that we might not think of. And as I said before, we never try to teach somebody coping strategies when they're already in crisis. You have to do it when they're at their neutral. Um, I did find some, well, we had them on our, on our toolbox um, and hopefully I will be able to share it. I found two really, really good um, resources for anxiety. So, this is a really well done one from, I put the link in the, in the uh, presentation. So it talks about what anxiety is. We go through a lot of different stages of it, the types of things that make people anxious. What, what can happen to you if you feel anxious? Because different people have different physical manifestations. Um, a lot of different ones. And what are some things you can do to feel better? So this is something that I would use for obviously higher uh, cognitive ability people, but this is a good resource. It, they, um, they had quite a few actually on there um, that you can use as well. Okay, let me share my screen. Yeah, so um, there were a couple of them on there, but I also decided this would be a good one to share because it's something that you can fill in some bubbles yourself. 
So you can look at what are the kinds of things that make me feel anxious. And there's a whole list of things um, and added ones that you can add into the bubbles. And um, then it's to also give you ideas for redirection. So when you're feeling anxious, what can you do instead? I can read a book, I can do a puzzle, I can listen to music, I could go for a walk. So these are usable tools and um, the resource is called free printable behavior charts.com and they have a ton uh, on there and then the next step um, is that you you can create your own social story for the person uh, talking about the different things that you can focus on when you're feeling anxious so um, imagining yourself in another place doing an activity doing your breathing and then there's one on how to breathe deeply. Uh, grounding is a technique that we use a lot as well. They refer to grounding in one of the other links that I gave you. And grounding is where you ask somebody to use all their senses so that they start focusing on what's going on outside of them. So name something that you can see right now, name something you can hear right now, tell me something you're feeling right now, tell me something that you can smell right now. So it really grounds them in being in the moment instead of ruminating in, in their brain about what, what is stressing them. And of course, there's also pictograms that we can use um, to give people skills on uh, coping strategies on what they could do. Uh, creating a social story. So this is one that I shamelessly stole from our toolbox that somebody else created. Um, but it's obviously using the pictograms instead of words and sentences. So it, it could help clients or students that are at a different level of functioning. Um, and this is the part where we have some questions. Um, but I wanted to just uh, have this up as a reminder um, from David Hinsberger, that first uh, disabled people were locked away in institutions. They were locked behind the opinions and the expectations of others and the power to say, this is who I am. Um, and I expect that your respect for me will define your support of me as something that people with disabilities have longed to say. So um, whenever you're intervening with somebody who's anxious or who has challenging behaviors, remember that this is part of the social role that is cast upon them without their choice. Um, and so go at it gently. Thank you, Janice. That was amazing. I oh, just want to thank you for reinforcing because I'm always talking about ABC sheets and taking data and not making inferences. And I think it's really important that we um, take that data, although I know it's not always, always well received, um, but it is important that we be very careful not to uh, assume that any, any behavior is for any particular reason and look at it objectively because we often see different patterns that we weren't expecting when we look at it that way. Yeah. Uh, and I also just wanted to mention, um, you know, sometimes we're the triggers in the classroom and it's important as teachers to look at, you know, the classroom design, how much decorations we have, our perfume, our jewelry and things of that nature, because those things, you know, obviously affect our students with sensory integration disorder, right? So, Absolutely. Thank you so much. A pleasure. Does anybody have any questions? chat stuff. So I did um, put some more resources in the end because I knew that I wouldn't be able to show you everything. Uh, but there are some resources on, uh, well, just the Calm app, C-A-L-M. I'm sure a lot of you have seen advertisements for it. What I like about that app, and there is a free version of it, is that you can, or there used to be, um, where you could just have it show the breathing in and out. It, it gets larger and smaller and it counts up and down. So it's a really good visual and auditory cue to teaching somebody how to do breathing. Um, and you guys have smart boards, uh, so you can hopefully pull that one up on a smart board and see it. I don't know if it's doable, but that would be a really good thing to do. 
in in closing, I did have a client who um, he said he was such a sweetheart. He always came in every single morning. He came in agitated. It was his morning routine was was entrenched in um, how difficult his roommates were, and his 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 caregiver was rushing him out the door. And every single morning, he would come in. And I had this lovely female client in the group who would who would just roll her eyes and say PMS, you know, she would joke. <laughs> that was why he was agitated. But what we started doing is uh, at first, of course, you know, I'm an educator, I've got to try to get to the bottom of this. And so I, I would try to, you know, therapize. And so what happened and what could you have done? And I spent a lot of time doing all of that with him and realized I was actually prolonging his anxiety by doing that because we were never able to come to the resolution. So instead I started putting on a Tai Chi DVD because it was 25 years ago. And we had this 15 minute video of the, the eight pieces of silk brocade. And we just did 15 minutes of Tai Chi within five minutes of watching the screen and breathing, he was laughing quicker than any other intervention I'd ever used. And he was able to go about the rest of his day without problem. So that's my ending story. Thank you guys, it's been a pleasure. Um, I'm blanking on his name again, but the Bill Nason, who I had told you about. Right. Yes, he has. Um, if anybody's on Facebook, you just have to type in the search, the autism discussion page. Um, he has three books where he talks about people with autism, and it's really a guidebook for families. But he also posts a lot about teachers and and um, people who work with uh, guys with autism, what can cause meltdowns and anxiety. And he, he's a really good resource as well. I, I did put his stuff in there too. Awesome. Thank you. No, th thank you so much, uh, Janice. Um, I'm realizing now that I just attended like a a, a course on classroom uh, on 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 management of uh, challenging behaviors that I should have taken um, during teachers' college, but that was not offered during my pre-service training, you know, so um, I really uh, appreciate that. Um, I felt like I was in school today and I, I mean that like, you know, uh, very complimentarily. Um, and thanks to the, my EPC colleagues who, you know, make these workshops happen and for being just such a supportive uh, network and, and such great supports for all of our SI, uh, SVI and alternative teaching staff. Um, and then of course, a special thank you to uh, you uh, for attending today, our teachers, our special ed techs, our behavior techs, everyone. Um, I appreciate what you do in your classroom uh, with and for your students um, every single day. You're the ones who are in there. And um, so again, uh, just so appreciative of everyone in this network. Thank you so much for your time and uh, stay tuned for uh, e an email follow-up, uh, which I'll send with, uh, with the resources from Janice. So thanks so much, everyone. Have a great uh, evening.